Alternative 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. Now your host, Nick Nanavati. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Art of War podcast. I am joined this week by another sisters aficionado. I'm so excited to introduce Brendan McKenzie. Brendan, how you doing? Doing great. Happy to be on. Happy to have you. Brendan has just won the Wet Coast Tournament up in Canada. Really tough super major with, you know, Art Award coaches there in attendance as well. And he's done it with a faction we've had on a few times and one that I've really enjoyed playing in the past few months, the Adeptus Sororitas, an army that really rewards you for excellent generalship and just solid play all around the table. In today's episode, we're going to get to know Brendan. We're going to get to know how he got into the Warhammer, how his journey has taken him from a mere novice to winning super majors, what that looks like and how he approaches the game from a playstyle perspective. We're going to break down his list top to bottom, we're going to learn strategies, and we're going to debate sisters because, you know, we both play that faction. And then in part two, that's going to be for our patrons. You can subscribe on AOW40K.com. That's where we're going to talk about the nitty-gritty good stuff. We're going to go into his matches from the Wet Coast GT game by game by game. We're going to talk about other matchups. We're going to talk sisters theory. It's going to get wet. Brendan, are you ready? (laughs) I'm ready. He's ready. <laughs> All right. So tell me a tale. How'd you get into Warhammer? So I started playing Warhammer a long time ago, I think in like third edition. I was a kid. I played Imperial Guard back then and just kind of played fairly casually, just enjoyed the minis and the lore and all that kind of stuff. Never really took it very seriously. Um, fell out of the game for quite a few years uh, in my late teens and 20s. And then over the course of the pandemic with nothing to do at home, I'm sure a lot of people have a similar story. I got back into the game, started building some models, started painting some models, started playing the game. And I I was playing Magic before, so Wizards of the Coast had kind of gone away from the competitive side of the game. And I sort of saw how Games Workshop was kind of re-embracing it and with 8th edition and 9th edition. And I really enjoyed what they were doing with the game. So I started to get more and more invested, started to be playing on TTS. And finally, as we came out of the pandemic, started to play some real-life games. And yeah, I just love it. It's great fun. That's awesome. I love that a COVID Warhammer player turned into real life Warhammers after TTS. It's cool to see TTS being used as a way to gateway people into Warhammer. That's not really a story we hear too often, but it, it's nice to hear it. Yeah, it was like for me, the painting and the modeling is very difficult. I'm not great at that part of it. I'm getting better, but it's definitely something I'm working on. Well, TTS just let me kind of just jump right into the actual gameplay. And I really enjoy playing with my own models a lot more than playing on TTS, but having that option to kind of start with it was really nice. Right, it kind of dissolves that barrier to entry, makes it a little bit less intimidating. Not that there's no barrier to TTS, too. There's quite a lot of hoops to jump in <laughs> yeah. to get that working, too. But... It took me two years to jump on that train. <laughs> it's got its own issues. So, Brendan, I want to talk about kind of how you grew as a player, because you're obviously getting in from TTS, where you have that, like, tabletop to model kind of dysmorphia, whatever you want to call it. And then, of course, once you start playing Warhammer, it's it's quite the ladder to climb, right? When you're just like learning how to roll the hit, roll the wound to like making tactical and strategic nuanced decisions. What has that journey been like for you? Well, honestly, it wasn't, I didn't find it that hard. Um, I had the history for when I was playing as a kid. And obviously, it's not the same as playing competitively, but I knew how, you know, wound rolls worked, how hit rolls work, all the basic stuffs. And then I played competitive magic for like, 13 or 14 years so a lot of like the little math stuff you kind of do in your head as you're playing kind of came pretty naturally to me um my first ever event with real models um i played with a not fully painted army and i would have gotten second if i'd been painted like with the extra points for paint points just on battle point tiebreakers alone and so i just kind of came to it like i was just really happy with it right away and i learned quick all the little details about movement and um how to fight and honestly, I watched a lot of Art of War content because you guys were kind of spooling up your content sphere. And there was a Appreciate lot of really good stuff to, stuff to learn, like just watching Richard and John play games. You weren't playing a whole bunch at that point, but watching Richard and John play games was really just like, oh, I can do this. Oh, I can do that. There was a whole lot of stuff I could pick up really quick. So I really like that. That's awesome. So that's a lot of the tactical part, right? Like learning the tech tactics and basically placing the models, how to do this little pile and how to do that little move block. You know, that's the micro level to Warhammer. The strategy, I think, is where a lot of people trip up, though, because it's easy to learn a tactic. It's just like a skill you practice a little bit. But the the strategy of understanding your army paired with another army and how you those things interact, how did you come up with that? Was it just through watching games and playing or was it 
but there's just some understanding beyond that. Well, I've spent so much of my life playing strategy games, and one of the biggest things in, like, for instance, competitive magic is figuring out who's the aggressor, who's the aggression, who's trying to win, who's trying to stall. And that translated, I found, very well to 40k, um, especially in ninth with the way victory points worked. Um, especially with sisters, I could figure out a situation where I'm going to end up at 95 victory points. If everything goes well for my opponent, they're going to end up at 85. That means they have to come to me. And with sisters, especially, they really like to do that counter punch. I found that in ninth and I found that in 10th. So if you can create a situation where your opponent has to engage into you, then you can do the counter punch. And I found that's kind of worked really well for me, at least. Yeah, so that's far. definitely a great strategy in Warhammer of time, you know, addition through addition is get ahead and then force your opponent to come to you and just counter punch that. That play that you described is pretty much spot on and very much like Sisters in Ninth Edition. Would you say that's like your play style? Have you played other factions besides Sisters? Um, well, I played Guard when I was a kid, and I have tried other factions on TTS, but I've really enjoyed the way Sisters play. I find that they can, they're very flexible. So, like, if I need to, I can go ham and just charge in and take points and try and score high and out outscore my opponent quickly, and they can't catch up. And then other matchups, I can opt into a much more safe defensive play style. Um, I think I prefer playing defensively, but I just like having the option to kind of do whatever. And I really find the sisters do that well in a way that lots of other factions kind of don't. They kind of have one speed they have to go at, at least in my experience. Yeah, I think sisters being a flexible faction is like a perfect description. You can really adjust your play, and you should adjust your play for your different opponents and matchups because you're the flexible in the situation. You have all the different tools. It's just on you to leverage them. Some of the things I find so enjoyable as a faction. But another thing I find very fascinating, Brendan, is like, how much diversity there are among sisters lists. You know, my list has no Volgons or Castigators and things like that, and you're just rocking up with both and doing really well. You know, it's... Where no does that... here. No here. Yeah. Oh, that's here. true, that's true, my bad. Um, <laughs> there's so many sisters lists these days. It's but, hard to uh, keep track. Exactly. Point is, there's so much diversity in sisters lists, so it's kind of hard to just follow a beaten path. You know, you can pick one of many, but like, you, how do you know which one to take? Did you forge your own path with sisters, or was your trial and error and like games and games and games, or how did you come up with your sisters list? So probably a mixture of like talking with people and trying things. Um, I always like to have my ideas get challenged because um, then it it opens up my mind to new things that some I like, some I don't like. Um, what I've found with sisters right now is that the variety of lists. They tend to change a lot depending on what terrain you're playing on, what sort of missions you're playing, and what kind of like your local meta is. Like I found people, some people love the castigators, and I found that I just never get anything out of them. I don't know if it's the shooting lanes we play on locally, or if it's just that my opponent roll their saves and succeed when I put three saves on them with the unit. Similarly with the Volgons, I think a lot of the Europeans don't like them because it's very hard to get them where you need to go on the UKTC or the WTC terrain. But on GW terrain, with those little two-inch barriers that they can hide behind, I found moving them around to be very effective. People say they get screened out from reserves, and I'm just deploying them on the board most of the time. So I think it's yeah. a lot of it is you kind of hear what people say that they find works for them. You find out why it works for them, and you try it out and see if it works for you. If it doesn't, well, then it doesn't. If it does, then great. You just learn something new. So. Yeah, I think that's a great mentality for it, and I think it's you know very similar to the approach that I took with Sisters when I was learning it, but the the way you've applied it and done the same thing, but just ended up in such a different spot is really fascinating. I'll admit a lot of my Sisters play is pretty much entirely on WTC terrain, and you mentioned that you know a lot of Europeans don't like the Volgons on that format as much because they, there's a lot more small pieces that are annoying for getting rapid ingress spots or just screening on the... GW board is a lot more big open lanes and these little nooks for you to hide in and then walk right over like you had mentioned. Do you normally play on GW terrain? Do you think that's influenced your build a lot? I think it has. Um, we're pretty close to Tacoma here and a lot of the local TOs went to the Tacoma events the last couple of years and kind of took everything they got from those events and just kind of copied it for what they're doing for their terrain. So we're very GW influenced in how we both uh, like the rulings and, and the terrain we use. And I quite like it. I've tried WTC and you can see on TTS. Um, I find it a little bit more, I don't know. It worked really well when towering was dominating everything and you had to hide behind stuff to survive. But I find that right now it feels almost kind of a little, a little too restricting in how you can play the game. Yeah, 
I definitely understand what you mean. Certain archetypes just don't really work with that many ruins and crates in the middle of the board and things. Yeah, exactly. With that said, though, it sounds like sisters are right up your alley. Their play style of like reactive and, and fluid and counter charge is, is perfect for you. Is that something you knew going in was like your play style, or is that so, something you've developed through playing Warhammer and this is just what's gravitated naturally to you? Um, I'm not sure. I think I just like kind of how flexible sisters are. Like throughout ninth, I played them very, very different ways. Like I played the Buddy Rose list, I played a Valorous Heart list, I even played an Argent Shroud list for a while. And they all played very differently, and you kind of experience the different ways the lists can play, the way sisters can do. Like, the, their durability is very weird, but when it works, it's just like you have a unit of sisters that just doesn't die to anything. And then there's also times where your whole unit disappears in a puff of flame, and you have to figure out what to do then. And I just kind of really like the way you have to figure out those puzzles as you go. Um, the one big weakness I found with sisters is Sometimes you make a choice turn one and you can't fix it. <laughs> so they're not fast like something like elves are, where if you move a unit six inches the wrong direction turn one, sometimes you're going to spend the entire rest of the game fixing that choice. And I, I think that kind of like the importance of a decision you make, I really like. I also like how the games kind of tend to always last five turns. Like a lot of people I know are playing these these factions. And they're just like, oh yeah, I tailed my opponent turn two, the game is over. And I'm like, I haven't experienced that in months. <laughs> I'm playing till turn five and grinding out every win by 10, 20 points. And it's just, it feels like the whole game I get to play every time. Yeah. I love that about Sisters too. It's such a unique experience when you get to play against each and every army because your approach just varies like that. And it's there's it's really punishing the mistakes and stuff. And you have to be really methodical about how you use all your different tools. It's very rewarding for sure. So why don't we talk about the actual list that you took to the Wet Coast Tournament, um, now that we know the format and the kind of area that it's played in. What was the list kind of top to bottom? So I think actually you and I are kind of like approaching the list the same way. Like I took the Volgons and you didn't. But mostly I think we're just kind of playing them as mission playing army. It's all about playing the mission and trying to score points and trying to survive rather than, I've seen lots of people playing like kind of more shooty lists or more scoring right. points lists like i want three times two crusaders as the start of every list i build <laughs> like i just want as many <laughs> little jerks on the right. board doing jerky Divide things. 2000 points. points by unit count exactly right so um uh the list i was playing before the level series data slate had the combo unit i really enjoyed that unit and then i just played a whole bunch of missions play around it and just built up miracle dice to shoot through the unit but then that unit got nerfed in the data slate, so I had to find a new thing. And that's kind of when the Volgons entered my list. Um, so I've got Morvan Vol and the Paragons as my like main hammer unit. Then I've got Junith as a CP source. I think Sister's strats are fantastic. Um, I used an Imagifier to modify my Miracle Dice so I can actually get some good Miracle Dice over the course of the game. Um, I've got the Palatine with Blade. I've got a Sacrificial Missionary. I got two squads of battle sisters, two emulators, unit of novitiates for the Palatine to join, uh, Rhino, one unit of Repentia, two units of Zephyrim just as fast chaff, three units of Crusaders, the full 30 Arco Flagellants, which is basically the other core of my list, and then two Death Call to Sansas just as 35 points to run around and do stuff, and one final unit of Seraphim for shoot and scoop on drop. That's the list. Beautiful. So I look at your sister's list and now I have a, a, a nigh for Sisters list, but you know, it from an untrained eye, it kind of looks like every other Sisters list, right? It's a bunch of Sisters units, it's got multi melters it's got arco flagellants, it's got fall guns, whatever. But when I look at this, you know, I have a lot of questions. My first question is where is Triumph? So the Triumph was actually my last cut from this list. I played an event a couple of weeks before Cascade Clash, uh, which is a little bit smaller, but same kind of six round event. And I had the Triumph in that list, as well as another unit of Repentia and another Rhino. And I found on the GW terrain, it was a bit tricky to get her where I needed her to be. And she was my main way to modify Miracle Dice in that list. So I really needed that six inch aura to be where I needed it to be to get sixes. Because I had some games where I just wasn't able to get where I needed it. And then I had no sixes all game, and I'm really bad at rolling dice. So I had a whole bunch of ones and twos, and that's just not the great way to play sisters. So I swapped her out for the Imagifier. Um, and I found that while I wasn't as reliably getting sixes, I was very much more reliably getting 
decent dice, fours, five, sixes, those kinds of things. The 12 inch or on an infantry model that doesn't have a giant base, I found was much easier to get where I needed it to be. And it also got me a whole bunch of extra points to put into more chaff, which is just, I love my little units running around doing stuff. Yeah, so, definitely like that. Yeah, that was the choice there. I think she's still a great unit, great profile, great stats for the points, great auras, but I just found that base was just, I don't know, it was tricky for me to use on the GW terrain at least. That's so fascinating, you know, the, just the way you talk about Triumph and the, the, the fact that you're running these Paragon Volgon units and you're you're deploying them makes me wonder if, you know, I don't play much with GW Train in my sister's army, but if I did, I wonder if I'd put Triumph in my list where you're putting the Volgons in yours because they do compete for space a little bit in, in terms of deliverability and where you want them and all that stuff. Maybe, maybe an unanswerable question, but definitely an interesting thought. Going through your list, though, like, how do you play it in your terms? Like, you said it's a mission-playing army, but walk me through, like, what what is your kind of go-to plays? So baseline plan is cleanse, deploy, flixed. That's my number one plan. If I can do that, I'm going to do it. And, and that's in, like, a normal five objective, just basic mission Five type objective thing. mission against somebody who I'm not worried about feeding a couple kills early. So, obviously, I'm purge the foe, less likely to do that. Vital ground, less likely to do that. But it's just a regular basic mission. If I can throw uh, unit crusaders, unit of death cults, my missionary out, score seven points, turn one, wait for my opponents to come to me, do that again, turn two. Um, you can often get two cleanses done with one Zephyr unit, that kind of thing. Um, just trying to score the points. And very effectively, I like to screen my deployment zone because I find that there's a lot of secondary missions that are hard to score without getting in your opponent's deployment zone. So if I'm scoring my points every turn, and my opponent can't score their tactical points, then it quickly becomes pressure on them to come to me. This sounds like 9th to... edition applied to 10th edition, <laughs> I gotta say. <laughs> it may be a little bit. Uh, and then when they come to me, then I can collapse on them. Um, not the ideal situation. There's lots of missions that doesn't work in. There's lots of matchups that doesn't work in. But that is plan A for sure. So plan A is basically sit on your side of the field, minimal trades, like two Crusaders go out doing action, two Death Cults go out doing action, um, and as the game proceeds, you'll use Five Sisters or the Rhino or whatever. And while you're doing that, it's really easy to just screen out your side of the field, which will naturally create a points advantage in your favor because you don't have to lose real resources. You're losing expendable stuff to passively score seven points a turn on secondaries doing cleanse deploy, cleanse deploy. Your primary should be relatively even if you're playing the standoffish game. So your opponent ends up taking tactical and then losing to you because they can't get into your deployment zone to unlock that capture in the outpost or behind any lines, that kind of stuff. And if they end up doing a fixed strategy, um, like assassinate, for example, they still have to come kill all your characters. And all of that creates a game plan for them uh, encroaching on your side, trying to make some more hammer happen and basically get you off of your game and win the game like that. So my follow-up question is, once they play the game with you and they start coming towards you, what do you do? So it's kind of like a switch gets flipped. Once they get to that 18 to 20 ish range, you go from, oh, yeah, I'm standing back here, I'm just standing back here scoring points to, oh, we're going now. And you just start putting all the pressure on. Um, I find that one sister's unit, very fragile. But if I shove 30 Arco flagellates, two emulators, a rhino full of repentia, the Volgons behind a wall, that suddenly is way more than most armies can deal with, especially the Arcoflagellates. And once they start having to interact with all that at once, suddenly there's Arcoflagellates all around their tanks, tagging things, touching things they can't maneuver, and you just start to cave in that from that point forward. Um, I really use uh, Suffering and Sacrifice a whole bunch to prevent melee armies from doing a whole lot. Overwatch with the Volgons on certain points can be very effective. Shoot back with the Volgons. There's a lot of strategy the sisters can use very effectively to, to kind of mess with things at that point. So you kind of go from, just come to me, come to me, we're just hanging out in the middle, just come have fun, to now I'm going to kill you, and you just turn it over, like, right quick. Yeah, and it's basically, you create this kind of chaotic board state where you're countercharging all kinds of stuff and threat overloading and just messing up your opponent. Is there, like, a scenario where you, I guess, do that and your opponent can respond effectively? Or is it just like too overwhelming and that's like just going to work as a strategy if you reach that as a win condition? 
So I haven't really experienced it where if I'm the one who's putting on pressure, the opponent can actually answer all of the things at once and does it successfully. I've had games where it ends up being super tight. Um, I find factions that have really good melee and really good shooting can be very tricky. Um, because if you're setting up a really good suffering and sacrifice heroic intervention play, and then they get a gun around a corner and pick up one of the units, your whole play can kind of fall apart. Um, so that can be tricky. But usually what happens is when they can answer that fairly effectively, because you're built up that early point lead, you can really kind of do little grindy plays, interrupt things here and there, touch that specific unit for one turn, that kind of stuff, and just kind of grind it out. Um, I went 5-0 at an event, uh, a big event in November last year. I think I had two wins that were like two and four point wins. And it was just that kind of thing where they'd answered my pressure, but we just managed to grind to a point where I just squeaked out the, the win. And is it common for your sisters to have really close games like that? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Especially if it's a matchup that's really tricky or a mission that's really tricky. Like Purge the Foe, if I win that, it's usually going to be a close win. Uh, and it was in this game too, in this tournament too. Um, right. Purge the Foe can be a really tough mission to win uh, with sisters, so, at least the way I play them. <laughs> it sounds like with sisters, it's hard to follow a single playbook. And I like that you gave me plan A and a pretty clear cohesive one. But I understand with sisters from experience, like plan A changes like the wind. You know, the mission plays such a factor, your opponent to play such a factor. And we're gonna talk about matchups and the game's actually played a lot in part two. But let's talk about some theoreticals. You know, if you're not playing a basic five objective mission, maybe you're playing something like the disappearing objectives or it's you know crazy servo skulls or the vital ground, for instance, something more reasonable. What happens to your strategy? How do you then create a scenario where your opponent has to come to you, or do you not try to do that? And then what do you do instead? Well, I find the list can actually play tactical very effectively. Like you have so many units still, and you have lots of speed and, and ways to move around the board in unexpected ways with Miracle Dice and the shoot and scoot on the Seraphim. So you can still play tactical very well. I just don't like living and dying on a card pull. <laughs> Um, I can find that they often, like, I played a lot of Magic over the years. If I can avoid playing with cards, I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. And I've also found that when I play that way, I have to spend a lot of time thinking about my opponent's cards to a certain, just to a certain extent, in a way I don't when I'm playing Fixed. Because in Fixed, I just have a plan that's like, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to prevent most of your things by doing this, and it's kind of simple and easy. But when I'm playing tactical and I have to kind of be everywhere and do everything, it's much harder to be like, okay, bring it down still on their deck. So I have to make sure this guy's over here so he can't be shot as easily by that. Like, it's just, it feels like there's a whole bunch more that I have to think about. So it's a lot more stressful um, in those games. But the list can still do it. It's just a whole lot more choices you have to think about. And sisters have so many decisions you make every turn. It can get a little overwhelming for sure. With your strategy of deploy homers and cleanse being plan A and you having like all these little two-man units and then five minions to follow up in the vehicles, it kind of seems like it, it's foolproof, right? You're endlessly just deploying homers and cleansing and, and so on and so forth. But in reality, Warhammer can get messy. If your opponent just puts some high OC, hard-to-kill units, maybe Custodes is an example, we don't have to get too deep into the matchups, but just something difficult and durable and going to control and box you for the objectives, or maybe just an normal overwhelming amount of army presence on them, Cleanse suddenly becomes hard because you don't hold the objective after your movement phase. You have to charge them and shoot them first. And things like action economy, as you're using all your crusaders and stuff, and you know it's turn three, turn four, turn five, if who's deploying the home? Or who's going to cleanse? If everything's dead, it's been a bloody game. That stuff can get really hard. Has that been a challenge for you? That's definitely tricky. There were definitely a few games where I did not get four points on cleanse every turn, uh, even in my wins. Um, sometimes you just can't get that second cleanse. Um, but I find that if you get it early and your opponent has to come to you and then you just start fighting at that point, you're just picking up points as you go and you're trying to kill their stuff and hold primary. Um, and that's when I find the Volgons really come to shine. If somebody puts a big brick on the middle and you get to surround it with Arcoflagellants, charge it and then have Vol follow up, they're going to be sitting there fighting Arcoflagellants for multiple turns while Vol just bashes their faces in. Because Suffering and Sacrifice and that particular combo is very effective against things like Custodes. Um, but you definitely you have to have... walk me through that Suffering-Sacrifice combo for maybe your less sisters experienced people? So Suffering and Sacrifice is the beginning of the fight phase. You use it, and the enemy has to attack that unit if it's within engagement range of it. And because Arcoflagellants have a base size that is smaller than one inch, 
what you can do is you can wrap a unit so everything in the unit is going to engage with the range of the arcoflagellants. And then Vol can still charge the unit because she can still reach within an inch. So Vulcans charge the unit. And then when you suffering and sacrifice, no matter what they do, they have to attack the arcoflagellants. And arcoflagellants' profiles are so awkward to kill, they're very hard to pick up in a single fight phase. Even a big custody brick can fail to pick up a unit. And then on the next turn, you can use that same stratagem again. And Vol gets like a shooting activation and two entire fight activations. And I don't care how tough your wardens are, they're not going to survive that. So that's been kind of my... And that's one of the toughest units to kill in the game. So if Vol can take that, she can take just about anything. That's some great, um, specifically his like study type, but really anti anything. Just a great nuance and a great use of archiflagellants and the Volgons. One of my challenges with the Volgons is partly the reason why I don't deploy them. And again, I play on WTC a lot, but um, they're going to have to walk around the table a little bit, and at some point they're going to expose themselves to real firepower. And they're four wound models with a two of four up, which doesn't sound soft, but I tell you, if someone wants this. 300 plus point unit dead it will die and you know i hate using losing units like that when i play sisters you you speak the trash life just like i do you have so many squads running around you don't have to care about anything and then you put this brick that you really have to protect and play carefully and care about still kind of slow easy to kill doesn't fly how do you manage that you have to think like a shooting player and you have to put your unit where their unit wants to go to shoot your vol guns so they can't go there. <laughs> and then you have to move your Volgons. There are multiple times blocking, I use basically, like, yeah. There are multiple times I use the six on an advance on that unit to get it to a safe spot. Like that's not how I want to use my sixes, but if I need them to get there and not get shot, they gotta get there. And if they need to move 14 inches to do it, they gotta move 14 inches to do it. The GW terrain has those little, they have the two-inch kind of bricks that you can move over with vehicles that you can also hide behind. And I think those are kind of key to how I, how I play the unit because it gives them a little bit more space they can move around and get around while still being able to... Because they are very awkward to maneuver. Vehicle keyword is really brutal on them, but 8-inch movement isn't as much as you think. But yeah, if you put units in the spots where they can get angles to them so they can't get that angle, and then you move into that safe spot, that's kind of the whole key to it. Now, sometimes you don't survive the unit you were killing in combat, you're stuck in combat, you're a vehicle, you can be shot, they get an angle on you, and they shoot you. Um, and you have to hope for the best. They got four up in bowls. They do have four wounds. You can use Miracle Dice. You can use CP rerolls. Sometimes Vol gets picked up, and you just make her get back up, and then she's just kind of a weak individual character. But as long as you get, like, one to two good activations out of that unit, I find that it does enough damage that I could win the mission with the rest of it. That makes a lot of sense. So it's like a lot of planning and picking and choosing your spot with the unit. And, you know, worst comes to worst, you can take some damage. It's not the end of the world, but obviously not the ideal. And move blocking, kind of prioritizing this as the tool. That kind of leads me to my next question with, like, pacing and Miracle Dice and stuff. When you're playing, like, a MSU, multiple small unit style list like this, and it's about delivering the killing blow turn where the 30 arc of run out and ball connects and you're just overwhelming your opponent, you're playing the game with a lot of small resources to start like we talked about the two crusaders do the actions you know five girls go out to go fight over an objective that kind of stuff what is like your your typical cadence for like releasing units onto the battlefield and at what point in the game do you decide okay it's time to go put the foot on the gas like what is your trigger points there if they come to a point where i can use the multi meltas in the sisters unit and the emulators to try and pick up a tank that's a good time to deploy that unit if they're just using some random up shaft unit of their own, your own seraphim or zephyrim are great at that point um basically you want to use as little as possible to achieve your goal kill whatever they put out but not give up too much because if you're using vol to kill five sisters on a point and then they get to put a whole tank into her that's not going to be worth it now as you play over the course of the game and you have less and less resources that becomes harder and harder to do in a way that uh doesn't give up all your stuff all at once um, but then I think once you hit that point where it's like, okay, it's go time, that's when you say, okay, I'm sending everything out. You can pick up Vol this turn, but there's also 30 Arcoflagellants about to charge your army. Are you able to pick up Vol and all those Arcoflagellants? Um, and that's kind of the questions you ask your opponent where you give them two bad answers. Either they kill that two units of Arcoflagellants and they only have one left to charge their army, but then Vol gets to walk in unscathed, or they kill Vol, but then there's Arcoflagellants everywhere. Like you give them choices where they have to make the right choice. And even if they do make the right choice, it's still a really bad decision that they don't automatically win from making. Right. It's just like a rock or a hard place. You know, shoot the arc of Lachlan, shoot Vol, doesn't matter which one you pick, you're still getting charged. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay, so that that makes a lot of sense. Is there like a scenario where your let me think of how to phrase this? Okay, so your opponent is probably going to take either tactical or fix, and if they take tactical, we talked about you screen your side of the board and you just kind of play around their secondaries where you can. That makes sense. But if they take fix and it's something also aggressive that plays into your strategy, but like from their perspective, like deploy homers and assassinate. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six characters or five characters, and they come back to life potentially. Obviously, there's a little bit of a trap element into it because they have to go get the characters and you're trying to countercharge them, as you put it. But if some aggressive army by nature just picks this and guns for it, it's just going to be kind of a war, right? Is that something you want? Is that is that okay? So I found that fix into this list is very much a trap. Um, I love using the missionary to run forward, generate miracle dice, do it to action, turn one. But if you take fixed, I'm going to sit that lady in my back corner screen at nine inches. And you're going to have to go get her. And you're only going to get her if you kill the rest of me. And if you kill the rest of me, I don't care that you took fixed or tactical. I'm dead anyway. <laughs> Same with June. If she's happy in the back corner. A magic flyer is a 12-inch aura, so she can deploy very, very defensively. And then I just got Vol and the Palatine that want to get in and punch. And if you kill those two, I don't have to res them. That's eight victory points. You get eight victory points on a secondary. That's pretty good for me. Um, and if you come into me with like a world leader's army or a sun sanguinous army, I can kill Marines like it's nobody business. If there's one thing sisters are good at, it's killing Marines. So oh, I haven't found that to be a, a losing point. Um, Arkel Flagellants are so good in those matchups. So yeah, if they come to me, I'm happy to brawl. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. It's it's kind of your army specifically doesn't mind um, not participating with its characters a little bit more because uh, June is literally just farm CP, Magifier's 12 inch range. The missionary does like to commit suicide, but to deny four points, that can just be worth it. Um, it's only 40 points, points, right? So, right. Whatever. Well, do you find like you have a lot of points in kind of it's only 40 points mentality? And I'm saying that yes, like. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> If, right, I, I know the sister's life, right? But do you feel like you maybe you're playing with 1,700 points of actual stuff against 2,000 points and people are just, like, afraid to approach it? It almost feels like I'm playing with, like, 300 points of actual stuff and then 1,700 points of just random annoyances. Um, the only unit that really hits hard is the Vol unit. The Palatine can do okay into certain targets. Two multi multis out of an Immolator can do okay into certain targets. But, like, it's not a scary like there's no aggressor brick or you know giant unit or angron or something like that in here um so it's really important to make sure vol is safe because otherwise if i don't have vol suddenly they are happy okay now i am going to shove into you <laughs> now i am just going to fight you because you can't kill my stuff especially things with two plus saves custodies can be really tricky for that um so it, it does become kind of a balancing act of making sure vol is where she needs to be but is also safe um because otherwise you just have a whole bunch of chaff and you can only play a mission so hard until all your stuff's dead and then you lose right i think that's it's a fine line with sisters right between balancing having not enough trash and too much trash and like actually having enough teeth to, to hurt somebody is this list like a, a list that you are pretty settled on obviously it did very well for your wet coast or, or do you tinker with this much i've got some ideas about how to change it going forward we might want to cover that in the second part but one thing I have noticed is I do have the one hammer, and I would really like to figure out a way to get a second real hammer in here. I've been thinking of that for honestly a while, but I haven't really found the answer for what that second hammer would be. So uh, I've got some a ideas. second Volgon unit. I would love to have a second Volgon unit, but you can't do that. <laughs> so, and I found that the just regular Paragons on their own just don't perform. Right. So, yeah. Could it I've just be something like that. 15 Retributors? You know? Oh, I, ugh, no. No. Okay. <laughs> Retributors have been the most disappointing unit this edition. Every time I use them, they don't kill anything. I got Yeah, honestly, I, it looks like such an amazing unit. It's 105 points, and you get eight multi multi shots and Cherub and Miracle Dice. And then it just does not translate on the table. I don't. They hit know. on fours. You can't get rerolls to hit anyway. Then usually they're wounding on fives re rolling. You're looking at two wounds. Most things have a four plus save. You get one save through. It just hasn't been what I wanted. <laughs> no. Not at all. Are you reserving anything with this army? It varies. People have asked me a lot of questions about the list, like what what leads what, what reserves where, and it depends so much on mission and opponent and deployment. Um, it changes all the time. I really like reserving at least one unit of Zephyrim, one unit of Seraphim, and one unit of Crusaders, just because it makes your opponent screen out no deploy homers. Um, so they have to leave some things back, which would be really tricky for certain armies. 
And then, like, I like to drop and shoot and scoot with a Seraphim a lot. There's lots of plays you can do with that. Um, but I often, like, sometimes I reserved uh, the Volgons. Sometimes I reserved the Novitiates with the Palatine. Um, I sometimes reserved all the Seraph- Zephyrim. So, yeah, it's kind of all over the place. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. It's, it definitely depends game by game. Is there, like, a general playbook you have for when to reserve or not? The more indirect my opponent has, the more I reserve. It's probably the easiest yeah. way to put it. Things that, like, Arcos don't really care about indirect that much. The other units want to be in either in vehicles or standing in a back corner. I like to deploy my Repentia on the field and then advance them into the Rhino turn one. After I was going to ask about out. the Repentia. What, what is going on with Repentia? I like them at 110, but I, they haven't actually made it into any of my list. Could you sell me on them? They are my attempt at a second hammer unit. I'm not sure if they succeed at that role, but there's something else that can kill things. It's an honest combat. effort they're putting in. Yeah, exactly. 110 is pretty cheap. Um, I used to have two. Now I have one. I think in the next version of this list, I might have zero. So that tells you how happy I was with them. But they weren't bad. It's just 18 attacks is so few attacks. Even with full really is. it can be really tricky to make sure it, it goes well. Do you find the one Rhino is enough? I mean, like, I, I have 20 Archiflagellants. Now I'm going up to 30. But I've had 20 and two Rhinos. And... I'm weary about just adding 10 more and still only having two rhinos. I think it'll be fine. You can cycle. But you have 40 infantry lady people and one rhino. So I found Arcos don't really need the rhino. Like, it's nice to have, get basically, but they almost always jump out of it turn one. Um, so it's just three inches extra movement. So the other ones are losing three inches of movement. But 75 points is a whole other, what, unit and a half of sister stuff. Like, Zephyrim are 60, Crusaders are 25. That's 85 points. The Rhino so itself it, is a unit, though, right? Like it can it is. It is. I used to play three. I went down to two. This list, one of the cuts I made from my Cascade list was I went minus one Rhino, plus one Immolator. Um, just because I found, like, my Rhinos are always full of combat units, so I don't get anything out of firing deck, which I find is kind of sad. Um, the Arcos kind of are okay on the board. I use Go to Ground a lot on my Arcos, which makes them even more durable. I don't know. I wouldn't mind a second Rhino, but I haven't found only one being an issue here i think i know the loose answer to this question is going to be it depends on the situation but (laughs) it's hard to answer some questions (laughs) right how do you allocate your strats you mentioned like you go to ground a lot on your arcos and suffering sacrifice obviously matters in close combat matchups but like just generally how do you value strats and cp management and well, well along those same lines miracle dice you have two resource pools how do you value what to spend sixes on fives on that kind of stuff so stratagems depends a lot on what your opponent is. If a shooting army, um, you want to be resing your characters. You want to be using go to ground, smoke, um, re-rolling advances, charges, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, most sister strats are kind of, me- like the really good ones are kind of melee focused, uh, especially the two CP stuff. So you kind of have CP to spend in the shooting matchups. You want to use grenades, you want to use tank shock, you want to kind of get extra damage wherever you can. In the melee matchups, you want to save every CP because one of the most devastating things that you can do versus a melee army is hold up heroic suffering and sacrifice, interrupt and fight on death. And then just say, okay, what are you going to (laughs) charge? Because all of those options with all the unit sisters have can just lead to so much chaos. And I had some opponents take like 30 minutes in a single charge phase trying to figure out what they were going to do. I made sure they knew what I could do and they had to figure out the puzzle. Some of them did better than than others at it, but heroicing, you know, five Zephyrim to touch two monsters and then using suffering and sacrifice. Like, it can be just brutal because whichever one they pick, you can interrupt on the other one. And then that's just, there's just so many things you can do. So um, that's kind of how I focus on the melee matchups. And then in the mixed matchups, that's where you got to do the little dance. (laughs) You got to figure out where can I afford to save CP to keep my anti-melee stuff up, but also survive the shooting long enough to get there. Then with Miracle Dice, I want to save it for charges, basically, almost always. Charges, saves, um, advances if I need to. Um, really? You're I not never... even mentioning damage rules here. If it kills something, sure. Uh, otherwise, I don't even, like. I don't try and do value damage, really. If a six kills a unit, great, I'll use it. But otherwise, no. Um, use your twos and threes whenever you can on little shots, like a uh, Hunter Killer or a uh, multi melt out of a unit with a baby or something. I guess that would be a melting gun. Um, but yeah, it's all about the the roles that decide games rather than just value, in my experience. 
That's so fascinating. I actually, because I have like not many multi melters, I have three emulators and three Battle Sister squads inside them. I really find myself using most of my miracle dice on connecting big damage with those multi melter shots. And it sounds like you're so much more focused on the movement and the charging and making sure you're getting where you need to go. And you know me, I love that way of playing. But I think it's how do you do enough damage with without actually pumping the miracle dice into damage? I feel like that is what allows you to play with, you know the charade we call an army and and have enough damage that it make count. I guess I kind of just, like, like twos and threes for sure, I'll use on that. Fours and ups I try and avoid using on that kind of stuff. And then if I get a little bit of, like, sisters are great at pushing luck. So if you get a little bit lucky in one spot, boom, that six goes in there and kills, you know, a tank, right? But if your luck isn't going that way, you just kind of let it go. I don't know. That's the way I play it. I mean, it's working for you. I just think it's so fascinating. It's cool, different approach with the same mechanics. I so found I the multi meltas like at least the mount I have can be fairly unreliable. Like an emulator yeah. with a melta unit in it, that's four melta shots. Two are hitting on threes, two are hitting on fours with rerolls to wound. One melta sh- gunshot hitting on threes, rerolls to wound. If you spike up and you get like three wounds through, great. You know, use your miracle dice. But I also find that because I'm using the twos and threes to hit with stuff, and I don't have the triumph. I'm already priced out of using a dice there, right? That's so, true, yeah. I have like a lot more specific number sixes, so I don't mind just using them on whatever. Um, yeah, my sixes are incredibly valuable because that's a guaranteed seven-inch charge. And yeah, no, for sure. It's also, if I've managed to position my first Arco unit so it touches a bunch of stuff, the second Arco unit can charge that same unit and be unable to base. So if I have a six, then I can slam the next dice, and if it's at 11, that Arco unit can go anywhere. <laughs> That that is a really. It sounds like you've got a really good plan for all this stuff with the tr- combat manipulation, the tactical side, all that. I think that's wonderful. I'm sure you've used that to kind of leverage your wins at the actual web coast. That's what we're going to talk about more in part two, the game by day game breakdown of how everything happened. I just have one more question for you, Brendan, before we head on over to that. If you had one piece of advice for any aspiring Warhammer player, what would it be? One piece of advice. Oof. Um, learn to communicate with your opponents well. Um, I think this game is so much more fun when you play it in a cooperative way with opponents who are being cooperative with you. It's much better to tell your opponent all your tricks and let them try and figure out how to beat them than it is to be like, surprise, (laughs) gotcha. I find that kind of like, is a kind of cheap way to win. Um, I don't enjoy it, at least. Um, I much rather play a game where my opponent knows what I can do and has to try and figure out that puzzle. Um, I find winning that way a lot more fun. And also, I think people enjoy playing that way more. They don't feel like they've been surprised or tricked. Yeah, um, I find that to be, you know, the only way to play 40K is play by intent. You know, we preach that at Art of War. You know, I love your answer. Communicate effectively with your opponent. That's not really one we highlight as its own thing to get better at or thing to aspire to. But absolutely, the effective communication, this is a social game. I think that's a great piece of advice, Brendan. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for chatting, sisters, and po- piquing my curiosity about how you make these ball guns work. I've learned a lot this episode. I'm sure our viewers have as well. And if you want to keep on learning, you can check us out on AOW40K.com. That's our Patreon. It's five bucks a month that gets you access to this episode, along with 230 other episodes. So, you know, tons of content, all centered around helping you get better and learn Warhammer. So, check us out. You also get access to our Discord server. Supports the show. Been doing this for five years. Can't do it without you. Thank you so much. And Brendan, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com.